is our food. That man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. Again, Lord, we sit at your feet and we ask that you would feed us, teach us, lead us, and more than anything else, Lord, help us to be obedient and help us to obey the voice of your spirit as you speak to us. Thank you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. We, we talked a little bit last week about um, protecting the altar, that which you've laid on the altar. This morning, uh, I want to talk about that sacrifice that you've laid on the altar. And I want to give you um, a kind of... Um, the positive side of it, of what happens when you lay down yourself and anything else that you would lay down before the Lord. And uh, the, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the power. That I have also known in my own life. And if there's anything that you ever need and a breakthrough for, as you lay down your life before the Lord and you lay down that which God is asking you to, something is bound to happen. Um, and then also what I'd like to weave into all of this is that God will never take something from you. It just won't come and just take. You're going to have to lay it down. You're going to have to present it. He is not a taker, neither does he steal, kill and destroy like the enemy does, but he's a giver of life and he waits for you to surrender. He waits for you, he will speak to you about that, but he'll wait for you to yield. Listen to this text in Romans 12, having gone through 11 chapters of what the purpose and plans of the Lord are. Paul here starts in chapter 12 and he says, I beseech you, therefore, and that therefore is very important for us. Anytime you see a therefore in the text, it's there because of what he said before. It's important for you to remember that therefore. I beseech you, therefore, and then in, in light of the 11 chapters that he had, that was his thesis in helping us understand, Paul, what it is that God's brought for us, to us. He says, in, in lieu of all that, in based on all of that, he says, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you that you present, here's the word, you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And notice, that, you know, it's very, very clear. It's like you have to present your bodies, and you might think, well, what about my mind? What about my spirit? Well, your body encases everything. So you yield everything. God's not going to take it from you, by the way. You're going to have to give it. And you're going to have to say, here I am. Lord, here, use me. This is what I offer. And the point is that as you yield these things to the Lord, the greater the sacrifice that you're making, the greater the power that will be released. That is a given. You might not know it, but that's what happens. And then it adds in chapter, verse 2 of that same chapter, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many of you want to know what the will of God is for your life? Here it is. And notice, he doesn't just say, Suddenly he will, you know, send it 
through the skies or whatever, the word will come to you, this is what I called you for. That thing comes as you yield yourself to the Lord. It doesn't come any other way. See? And that's why sometimes it doesn't work for people because when they hear this from some prophetic people, but they have not engaged their bodies, you know, in obedience to the Lord. They don't yield to the Lord and therefore the whole thing is aborted. Not God's fault. Remember when the Lord came to Mary and he said, this is what God wants to do. It's always asking, God asking, God um, beseeching in this way. He says, look, this is life. This is the way to do this. I want, I'd like you to do this. And then she said, here I am, do with me as you please. Do you understand? God is not a rogue. How is that for a contemporary word? He does not steal anything from you. Nothing. He doesn't steal you, but the devil does that. He will steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. That's his job. But the Lord waits for you. And you can say, well, God wants, you can take what he wants. No, <laughs> it don't work like that. You know, some people invite me like that to their house. Sometimes they say, okay, come when you want. Eh? It's fine. I know it means no. You might think, no, I don't mean that. Well, I'm not going to just walk in there. You're going to have to sit down, look at your thing, and say, which day can you come? You know, like that. If me, I'm a human being, evil, how much God would want you to yield to him, to ask him, to to say, what do you think? And some people are like presumptuous. I think I want to do that. I think this is what I'm supposed to do. God said, I never asked you. I never approved of it. Do you understand that God's a gentleman? He waits for you. And then if you want something done, he will call on you. I got your attention. Wonderful. So, I've got to go somewhere. So, you've got to be with me. Whenever something is given to God, hmm, it releases his power, his power on that thing. And he, he, God, releases his power through it. Because now, that has been given to him. That, if something is given to him, it's not yours anymore, it's his. He may give it back to you. But when he gives it back to you, it's very different. Because now it's got his hand on it. It's now blessed of him. So, so that's, why, that's why the enemy hates when you give something to God. He hates it. He hates when you give yourself and you give anything to God. He, the enemy hates it because he is a rogue. He is the one that steals. And he doesn't want because he knows when you put something in God's hand or that little that you put in God's hand becomes much because of power that is being released through are you listening are you hearing are you hearing listen this is this is going to help you in your life so the enemy hates it and that very act not only blesses God the fact that you're giving to God that act not only blesses God, but it blesses you. So this is the breakthrough for you. And you'll be praying for breakthrough. Or I need to go and see some people here and let them pray for me and let this, that, the other. I need to fast and pray and seek the Lord. All that is good. But I'm telling you, the easiest, simplest way for you to have anything with God is to go before God and talk with him. Tell him, you know what? I've blown it of this, of that. So, okay, okay, I understand. Here I am. And then God begins to deal with it. My mother somehow figured this out, my mother. Because what she did, she carried me in a womb, right? Not, not a Christian, she was a Hindu, a practicing one. 
she carried me in her womb and presented me to Jesus. And that presenting, as I read from Romans 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice is very, very important. Somehow, she understood this dynamic of you praying about something. That alone, your praying is a sacrifice. Hello? And what you're praying about is, it could be, could be really huge as far as God is concerned. God says, yes, I will take your child. And your child is a son. And he will be called Samuel. This is the work that I call for. He won't make, maybe she didn't hear all that. But when she took me in her womb and presented me to the Lord, do you know how important dedication of children, consecration of children is? Vital. When you lay hands on something, you lay hands on people in praying for them, they are blessed of God. So when you come for prayer and you get people to pray with you, please lay your hands on me. Don't get worried about well, what I'm going to get if they lay hands on me. Don't worry about that. People are very spooky about it. I don't understand that. You think if, if you ask God for bread, will he give you stone? No. If you ask him for fish, will he give you a snake? No. So don't be worried about it. I don't know who laid hands on me, but you know, I, I turned out like this. Right? So don't, don't get all religious and, you know, weird. This church is not about being weird. Don't be weird here. Just accept it as coming from the Lord. Right? Now, when you pray with people, be careful how you pray too. Don't just say things because, you know, that feels good. You heard it on YouTube or something. Pray what you think. Very simple. You don't have to do it. This is not very complicated, by the way. God and God's things in church, it's not very complicated. Only the enemy makes things very complicated. He does. It's not complicated at all, this thing. So, my mother presented me to Jesus in a womb. Simple. God said, I'm taking him. Her presentation was a sacrifice because she was a practicing Hindu. And it was huge for her to do this. Those days you have to do the prayers. You know, I'm not going to name all of that now. Take the hair off, this, that, and the other. She had to pray, but she didn't do it. She refused to do it. She said, y'all can do what you want. Me, I'm not going to do that. I lost two children. I know the pressure of that. And she was only 19 when she had me. Is there any place in scripture where you see God just taking something? Can't find it. He just go and take it. No. He always asks permission. Imagine that. Why? Because he gave you your own will, your choice, and he wants you to give. When you give, you must give cheerfully. I know we talk about money in that way, but that goes for everything. You need to be cheerful. If you're not cheerful, don't give it. I don't like when somebody gives me a gift that they're not really happy about it. You know, you know, you know. I don't know. If you, I don't know. You know, that, you know, be cheerful. Give it. Give the whole thing. It's fine. He does wait for me to offer it. So when we present something willingly, cheerfully to God, it's what he desires to see. And he sees it. He knows the heart. Right? And he takes that. He doesn't steal it. He takes what you give him and goes away. Listen to this one in, 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 in John 10.10. 10. It says this. Now, John 10.10. 10. You are reading it, I'm sure, already. Because I can't see it over there. Something's happened to that communication. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. See, I've come to give you something. Verse number 18, it says, Jesus speaking, talking about himself, no one takes it from me, talking about his life. Look at verse 17, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life. See, 
that I may take it again. When it gives, when it's given back, it's God who raises him from the dead. But he is the one that's giving it. Do you understand? Yet he is the second person, the Trinity. He is, a, is the God that created us. But he is also in, in that capacity as the son presents himself. And it says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. Verse 18 says, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my father. So you, you know, you have to think about, sometimes people, you know, we say to God, no, you, whatever you want, you can do. You know, that's bad giving. That's a blemish offering. Doesn't feel right. You and I need to present it to the Lord. We need to present ourselves and we need to present everything that we have willingly, cheerfully, and say, Lord, I am yours. You would, and now you've got to be careful now because, see, we don't want to abort God's plan. You give yourself to the Lord. You can't walk away. You've got to walk with him. Right? Because God going to say, where that offering is taking a walk? <laughs> you put something on the altar and a, a living sacrifice. Because what's the, the point of the living sacrifice is it can take a walk off the altar. Hmm? Sometimes I have to slow down because I think, you know, we, you know, this is like a university stuff. <laughs> Yet, it is so simple, you can kick yourself. So, I lay it down. And if and when, if and when God gives it back, it usually returns very blessed and it will bless others. In 73, 1973, I came to the Lord, and um, one, of the, one of the things I felt God put in my heart at that time, apart from coming to him, I felt like I must give up my band, which was huge for me because music is still, I still play, and, uh, but I don't play like I used to play. Uh, and so God, I felt like God saying, um, give that up, walk with me. You, you can't walk off the altar when you, when you lay something down. You've got to yield it. I was playing with the band uh, Magnus in those days, and Magnus is a, quite a popular band, or was at that time. And prior to that, I had my own band. And I've been playing since I was 14 uh, in my bands, so I was like quite um, skillful, and, and I became quite famous around here. Won a couple of contests and so on. So I was like thinking music is going to be the thing for me. Um, but I had to lay it down. And I willingly laid it down. I walked away from my band. I presented myself to the Lord. And I, I was there in the church. And whatever it is that they, they asked me to play on, in, the, in the band, I was playing one of the guitars, I think. And, um, and with music that uh, not, it's not something I was used to um, and playing because my, my main uh, instrument was a lead guitar and I played heavy metal music for those of you who understand. It doesn't understand Google. So it was quite raw, quite rough. And so some of the music, for you to understand it, you've got to be drugged. <laughs> you've got to be goofed. You know, you've got to be in another world to get understand that kind of music. Some of the music I played, the other day I think my, one of my sons asked me, so how long were the songs you played? I said, hey, you were 45 minutes, one song. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite funny. Anyway, what's the point? So we're here um, in the church. And then they put me in a choir, but this I, I volunteered. And I want to sing in a choir. And you, if you the, sing in the choir, they gave you a gown and they gave you an overlay, you know, like that. And then they gave you a book. Auntie on the piano had a white uh, couple, Pastor, I guess. She would 
boom, and everybody get up. And we, sang, we sang the songs that Rani and I, every now and then we'll launch into some of those songs. She was in the front row singing alto, and I was singing tenor in the back. And our, and, our, and our choir was quite good, and we went around doing this. But, you know, one day I remember in the back, back row of the choir, I just wept, cried, not like in sorrow, thinking, what, the, what happened to me now? No, I was just so thrilled that I could give myself to the Lord like that. And I guess if, if some of my friends saw me in that state, hmm, with a gown and an overlay <laughs> and a book, they would think, what's the point? Eh? What a waste. And they told me that some of them that met me, what a waste of talent, God. But then, you see, we're talking about the greater the sacrifice, greater the power. So there was a prophetic word in 79 about my leading worship in the, in, in, the, in the congregation of the Lord and so on and so on. I don't understand any of it. But 1980, we started this church, 1980. And then one day, the, the, the leaders came to me during the worship time. Uh, during the church time, and they said to me, you know what, um, we don't want to lead worship here on Sunday morning anymore. Really? Because we used to have that, you know, fellow that conducts the stuff with his mic, you know, whatever it is. Hallelujah, glory. Everybody stand now. And it was, it was going like that. God, we moved from there 40 years ago. You imagine this, 40, long time. Don't do that here. We went away a long time. Now we've got the TV, it's over there. We like it in our lounge there. Don't bring the TV and put it this side again. Leave it there. Right? There's some things we like done a certain way because we've had that a long time ago. And we moved and there's a reason for it. Because God's been doing something with us. And so I had an understanding. They said, we're not going to do it anymore. You must lead it. I said, really? He said, how am I said, you do it from your p piano. Um, and I said, then who's going to preach? He said, you're going to preach. I said, I must play and then come. I was, I'm still doing that. Can you imagine this? <laughs> you're going to play and then you, yeah. But then I was leading it from there. I didn't have like a, like a Emmanuel. I was doing it from there. What happened, cut a long story short, is that God Gave that music back to me. That's the point. He took it from me one way that was raw and rough and there was drawing people away from heaven to hell. Hmm? And then he gave it back a few years later. He says, now I want you to do this. And guess what? We became quite popular in the country as a worship team. Because God now took the worship to the country, the people, the vineyard people particularly. And we've become known more and more in our community as one of the churches where you would go and enjoy true worship. Why is that so? Because somebody yielded their sacrifice. Do you understand? Somebody gave something. And what God does, he takes that. And he blesses that. Now, my life is very simple. But if I talk about John Wimber, who was the leader of the vineyard, he's late now, and he had a multi-million dollar business, a music business, and he wrote songs like um, as part of our, the band called Righteous Brothers, and he sang songs like uh, Unchained Melodies and so on. He was one of those guys that recorded and, and produced that. So his company was um, in the millions. And then he became a Christian. After a long story, if you can read about it, John Wimber's story. 
And then the Lord, um, he felt, again, the Lord didn't push for anything, but he felt like the Lord wanted him to give it, give the business away. And, the, and he said to the Lord, do you want me to, to sell it? He said, no, give it. You know, sometimes you think, well, I should sell it because what's going to happen? I can have some money to, you know, it'll take care of my pension or whatever. You know, I can do some work with that, serve the Lord. But the Lord somehow, you know, the, the principle is the greater the sacrifice, the greater the power. That's the way it is with him. So he gave, cut long story short there too, he gave the business away to his friend who uh, almost died when he heard that. And then after a while he found out that he, he couldn't you know, do anything because all he did all his life was play music. So he ended up cleaning oil drums because nobody would hire him. Along the way he would get fired and so on. Ended up cleaning oil drums. A multi-million dollar businessman who had given up his job, given up his business, didn't sell it, gave it away, because that's the way God wanted it in his life. And then eventually he started cleaning oil drums, and one, one, somebody comes by and offers him a million dollar contract to do um, a, an album that year for, for Christmas. He says, come on, what's going on? What are you doing here in this oil drum thing? You know, and he was, he was struggling. I mean, there's no money. It's a million dollars. That'll be great. He said, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. You know, this is what God wants. And I'm willing to give that up and to lay down my life. Do you know today that everything that we have as a church came from that offering? Do you know that the vineyard music around the world came as a result of that offering? Do you understand? How can you pay for it? Million dollars, worldwide, global ministry. No money. This is what God wants to do with you. Imagine that. Now, you might not have that because that was not offered to John right in the beginning. Neither was it offered to me. What I'm going to give you, uh, you wait and see that music will happen. You know, really, you will bless the nation. No. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is said up front. You do this, I'm going to do that. All what when God wants and he puts it in your heart to lay down something, then you have a choice. If you want to lay it down, I'm encouraging you with the stories so that you can, you can really go ahead and think about it and as God might be asking you for something. He won't take it by force. When he gives it back to you, it'll be blessed and it'll still continue to bless people. I've, yesterday, was, uh, we did a funeral here, by the way. One of our friends passed away. And we did one early morning. Um, and then there was a guy in the funeral uh, service that spoke to me later on when we had uh, lunch. And he goes to another church. But he said to me, you know what? Every Sunday, he hasn't come today, but every Sunday, he says, almost every Sunday, after my church finishes, I come here just for the worship and then I'm go. Go figure. Because your offering on the altar blesses people. God will take that and bless people. I don't think I could have that kind of longevity if I stayed in my band. I think I would have been dead by now. And the guys were saying, play Christian music. We will play Christian music. And God would have none of it. You're going to have to lay all or nothing. 
Do you understand? I don't know if you understand. But I hope you do. So let's, 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 let's move on. I'm going to skip some stuff. Abraham. Abraham in the Bible you read. God said to him. Listen to it. Verse 1. In, in Genesis 22. I like what happened here to this guy. Listen very carefully. I'm not going to be long and be done. This is the part I've been waiting for all week to share with you, right? Verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abram and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. What happened? <laughs> I remember, this is Abram. God was speaking to him for, well, he called him for a while now. He's been walking with God for about 25 years. And then, and he'd been waiting for a child. See? He's been waiting for a child. He couldn't have children, his own child. And so, 100 years old, he has Isaac. 121 years old, now, he's asking, God's asking him to take that son who he had been waiting for all this while and to give him to, to the Lord. Lay him on an altar to, in a place that he will show. Imagine that. Just think about If you were Abraham and you heard that kind of order, Think of it. That's wild. See, my mother could have taken a chance on me. She could have said, well, I'd rather do me. I'll, I'll pray again, you know, my way, and, and I'll give this, that child to whoever it is. She was not going to take that chance. Those two children died within the space of two months gone. She was left without any children in her house, and here I was. I could understand the anguish of my mom. Anguish. But my mother lived to see this. She was one of the foremen here when we were building this. <laughs> so Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Why God labors, the spirit of the Lord labors details in this particular chapter on Abram. Very important because when you offer something to the Lord with God's hand on it, it's huge. Don't be worried about it. Whether your child is here or your child is gone to heaven, don't worry too much. Whatever God gives and if he takes with God's hand on it because you've given, you would know that God desires the best for you. But what's coming out of that is far glorious. You may not know it and appreciate it at this time, but you will. This kind of gospel you don't get. What you'll get is another one, a superficial one. Ask it, name it, claim it, frame it. You won't, won't get this. It's superficial, I say. Superficial. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, Isaac and Isaac his son, and, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God... Spirit of God laboring each thing that will happen that morning in this man's life. And I tell you, for the Spirit of the Lord to be putting this together for us, God was so pleased. I'll show you now why it pleased him so much. Then on the third day, three days journey they went away. He couldn't change his mind. It was like you go to Jobo from here the whole day, right? 
If you took a walk from here to Joburg, that would take you probably three days, maybe. But it's a long way, right? Three days drive is like going to Zimbabwe and then Mozambique. We've done that. It's not easy for you to come back. You know, this guy is taking a walk with his child. And right through the entire journey, he has to think about this thing. And he could back off. Do you know, you and I can back off, walk off the altar. We can do this thing. But when you give it, you will see what happens when you do give it. Then on the third day, he lifted up his eyes and saw it afar off, the place far off. And, the, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And notice how he says, and we will come back to you. Hmm? We're going to come back to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife. And the two of them went on. And, but Isaac is 21 years old, not a small dude. He's a big boy. He's bigger than his father. He could have overpowered that old man. And Isaac said to Abraham, his father, my father. And he said, yeah, I am my son. Then he said, look, we have the fire, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? You would imagine that Abraham must have sighed deeply. Oh, he is going to be the lamb and he doesn't know it. How am I going to tell him that he is the sacrifice? In verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, I love this guy. He's a true man of faith, this. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there, took his time, put the stones together, and placed the wood in order, and then looked at his son bound his son Isaac and had no movement from Isaac no retaliation no uh, fight he just let his father bind him and he laid him on the altar imagine that God didn't stop him and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son and he went like this and then the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For I know, for I now know, I now I know that you fear God. How's that? You want God to know that you love him? Then you will do what he says. Not what you think is right. Can't just goof off and do what you want. Take somebody to bed that's not yours. I don't know where that came from, but it came. <laughs> it's not yours. You're a rogue. Don't steal the thing. People steal money, I know. You know, steal money. They don't give God's thing to God. They steal it. That's why there's no blessing. We're going to talk about money today. We're talking about this bigger things. Don't lay your hand on the child. Don't do anything to him. For I now, for now, I know you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, you would think this, this guy is demented. But I tell you, when you walk with God, it's quite dangerous. But it's not because he wants to take away from you and kill you because he's not like that. He wants to take what you give him and put his hand on it so that which you've given him is very blessed. People earn a little bit. I've seen how God blesses them when they give until they are able to get a whole lot of things from the Lord. God blesses you so that you don't have room to contain that's why God says you must test me. Test me in this. If I will not open the windows of heaven. 
and give you a blessing. And then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram sheep caught in a thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it on, uh, up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. What that means, the Lord will provide? Jehovah Jireh. People use that flippantly again. You're Jehovah Jireh. You will learn. But it comes out of sacrifice. We don't use these words flippantly. You are Jehovah Jireh. You will give to us and make. Yeah. When you sacrifice, you will see God's provision when you give yourself. You can't put the court card before the horse because there's a lot of people telling you a lot of things at your, your YouTube and everywhere else. I'll tell you, you've got issues. You've got to go back to God's word. And so the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. Now God tells you why that sacrifice is greater than everything else. Why that sacrifice will pro produce great power. Listen very carefully, people. I wanted to say this the whole morning, and I'm going to land as soon as I, I say some of the stuff. Call to him a second time. It says, verse 16, God speaking. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and the sand of, on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. What a blessing. What a blessing. And it's not because you just flippantly use the term, well, God is going to do that. He can make me op occupy the gate of the, of, the temp of the enemy. And we are going to be there. No, it comes out of a life of sacrifice. As you yield to God, don't use scripture like you think you want. Yeah, you, and then you find nothing happening and you get discouraged, you know? There are principles. Follow them. And then the Lord says, in your seed, that is in Isaac, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And he said something like that. He did something like that to John Wimber because that music went around the world. I think we have now maybe upwards of 200 CDs in the last while. 200 CDs the vineyard produced and then all the churches that have been vineyard, whether in the UK or wherever in the, in the world, have all produced CDs. Man, I think we must have got a thousand CDs. That's how blessed the ministry of worship was all because one guy gave himself to the Lord that way. You can never pay, can't, can't equate it with some cash. How much does that cost? Money, nothing. And so, yeah, Abraham is getting, he says, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you, that seed, because you have obeyed my voice. And, and Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Bathsheba and so on and so on and so on. And in Romans it says in verse, uh, chapter 4, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. Verse 17. So God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And verse 18, and who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. He could not be the father of many nations, yes my point, without sacrifice. Could not be. When we offer anything to God, there is context. Always context. See, I didn't know at that time when I'm walking away with the, uh, from my music and whatever else and letting go. I didn't, in fact, I, I didn't listen to the music at that point for what, eight years. For eight years. Didn't have any contact with what was happening. 
in the in the world and the scenes of the world. All I did was have the gown and the overlay and played in my band. I gave myself totally to that. What God does sometimes want is for you to die. So that he will live through you. I don't know if you know this gospel. But you are here and you are my subject today. I'm going to land any minute. So, when we offer anything to God, there's context. It's the mercies of God, what God is able to, to transform. What was the breakthrough, you think, for Abram in the 80s? See, what Abram did, he gave up one son. Abraham gave up one son. But he returned from that mountain that day with many nations in his bosom. Do you understand this? He gave one son, even though it feels like he never really gave it, but he did give it. And God acknowledged the fact that he, was, he could have done it, and he stopped him from doing it. He had all the time in the world to walk away from that altar. Three days he could have walked away. But I tell you, for God to give this guy a ministry that will reach the world, it's going to be huge. And so the greater sacrifice was required. And because there's a greater sacrifice, there's going to be greater power. God said, I have sworn to do this. You in your seed will bless the world. And so God blessed him. He gave one son, he came back with many nations in his bosom. He became the father of many nations. And God was under oath. His word was his bond. In blessing I will bless you. In multiplying I will multiply you. Don't listen to people that say things flippantly. People, go back to God. Let me land with this. Father God. And this whole type with Abraham is just like Father God giving his son Jesus for the sins of the world. Father God on Calvary slew his son. Slew his son. Didn't slow down and stop. Just like Abraham was given the break. Yet God said, he counted it as that man is dead. That Isaac is gone. And that Isaac is now mine. That Isaac has been laid on the altar. And that Isaac was not removed from the altar. I have taken Isaac. And because of my hand on Isaac, he will be a blessing to the whole world. And through Isaac came the Christ. That's how he became the father of many nations. Do you know the greater the sacrifice, the greater the power. And God gave his one son on the altar. He was laid on the wood. And father gave one son. But father got back many nations. Do you understand the principles in the word of the Lord? It's a divine principle. And that we are also called to lay down our lives. Yeah. As I said. And we will see God's love. Because God is so generous. You can never, ever, ever outgive God anything. Never. You can give him a teaspoon, he's going to throw a spade. That's what God does. I've known him for about 50 years doing this kind of thing. That God is able. Yeah, it's going to cost you some tears. It's going to cost you some sweat. Yeah. But when you say yes to the Lord, <laughs> Great will be a reward. And, you know, talking about Mary, she was a very, very, Mary is honored today. Some people go on a little bit extreme, Mary, you are a God. She's not a God. Mary has been, you know, exemplified uh, because of a sacrifice. What was her sacrifice? Her virginity. 
Usually you want to give your virginity to your husband. Jesus was in a womb by some miracle and broke through, through her virginity. She, she had not known Joseph, any man for that matter. God had impregnated her with his word and Jesus was born and came forth out of that womb. That was her sacrifice. Do you understand this? I'm not sure. But we make some mistakes in our world and we do not really sub submit to the Lord. And I'm hoping that, you know, you will think through this, really, all of this. Like as a young man, I had to think through some of this stuff. I read the book and I began to think seriously about what God was doing. And in my young life, and based on my mother's prayer, because she had dedicated me, she says, you save this child, I'll give this child to you. That was her prayer. And I was born. And when I was 19, I too was born again. And when I went full time into ministry, I went to her and spoke to her and said, you know, Ma, I'm going to leave my job and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to, this is, she never said, oh, what a nice job. Why are you going to, nothing like that. She says, she said this, you know, I always knew that when I gave you to him, that's how she speaks. When I gave you to him, I knew he will take you. I do have. He said, I got a second birthday. Yeah. Let's all stand. Why well, I'd like sometimes you to go home and start thinking through stuff because that is genuine. You know, it's genuine. But we can do some work here now. Or we can, because I'm sure as I was speaking, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you about some things. He's putting his finger on things in your life. And perhaps you're also questioning and asking. God's not going to take it, by the way, on his own. So, no, yeah, I'm here, you take what you want. No, he doesn't do it like that. You have to present it. You have to yield it. You have to lay it down. That's what the word present means. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It means you're going to have to give it, lay it down. Even as Jesus laid it down. It won't come any other way. So this morning you can actually lay it down. Lay whatever it is you want. Be sincere, be serious. And I tell you, if you're struggling with stuff in your life today, and if you lay it down, I believe, even as you quit, if you're like, you got like say, a simple thing like a, a habit, hmm? you don't want to do that thing. You lay down before the Lord. So now I'm going, today, I'm going to lay down that thing. I had to learn how to lay that, those things down too. I too had to quit drugs. I had to quit my other habits. I had to walk away from women. I had to walk away. Walk away. Walk away from that whole lifestyle. Walk away from my band. God is able. And he's able to sustain you. You can say to the Lord, I don't know, it's up to you, you're going to help me. When you sacrifice like that, there's power being released. God will sustain you. You believe it. God will sustain you. So, stretch out your hand to the Lord. And I don't know what it is. You might have a simple thing like a habit, like I said. Or you might have some very serious things that you feel God's been speaking to you about the last while. And if you want to talk those things through, then you can talk to me or talk to somebody about, about those kinds of things. May the Lord help us. It's not going to be 
a sad day. It's going to be the glorious day because God is uh, Jehovah Jireh. That's his name. You know that. And he will provide for you. He will provide for you. He will make a way of escape. He will give you the strength you need to overcome. But you must lay down and say, Father, I don't know. I'm going to live the next hour or the next day. I'm now laying this down. So whatever it is, I'm not sure what it is. It could be very big, it could be very small. But God's able to pour out his power. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we love you, we love you. Thank you for your mighty word, Lord. And you see all of these things that you do. We are overcome by that. We are really overcome by that. And we, we are blown away by, by the way you do things and who you are. And we know that you do not steal from us. We know who steals from us and who kills us and destroys us. But we know that you love and that you're a giver. And so today, we were to willingly, cheerfully yield ourselves to you. We're not afraid. We're not afraid, Lord. We know that you're able to give us strength. We know the enemy is shouting now and he's saying things, don't do that. Because how are you going to live? How is it going to work out for you? I rebuke the Lord. I rebuke the enemy. And the Lord rebukes the enemy. You yield to the Lord. You yield to God today. Yield to God. Yield to God. I, I, I promise you that God is able to help you overcome. You might have chemical imbalances, all of those kinds of things, but God is able to sustain you as you yield to the Lord. It's going to be frustrating, but God is able to sustain you. Whatever it is that you're laying down, don't go back. There'll be lots of temptations, even more so today. Don't go back to that. Rather you be home, rather you be around the word, rather you be around the Lord and seek him. Lord, I pray that as we would stand before you, whatever it is that we are yielding to you, you know. And I pray and those things that you're calling forth in our lives today, those things that you want to do in the world. Something that will, that you make our life count in this world. Lord, I pray, bless our young people. Bless our, our people. Bless them all, Lord, I pray. Take us as we want to yield to you. We yield to you. Have your way, we pray. Bring the miracle that we need, I pray. We give and we yield our children and parents, you have the power to do that. You have the power to do that now. As my mother did when I was in a womb, you have the power. God gave you authority, father and mother, gave you authority. And you can say to the Lord, here I am. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray for my children. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray your blessings on them. You can do that now. Go ahead and yield them again and again and again. Bless them. May they hear your voice. May they surrender themselves to you. Take them and bless them, I pray. Multiply them, I pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We too have received the blessing of Abraham. We too have the blessing of Abraham because of Christ. Thank you, Father, for your work. Bless you, Lord. Amen. And the Lord bless you.